Hello, I'm Rick Amasino from the University of Wisconsin, and I'd like to talk about our development of materials to get genetics into the classroom, in particular, the K-12 classroom. There are lots of organisms that are suitable for classrooms. Shown here are a few, such as the nematode C. elegans, or yeast, or drosophila. But also, plants are a good classroom model. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the advantages of plants. Unlike Drosophila, they don't fly away. But more importantly, plants are easy and inexpensive to grow. The seeds are very easy to store from year to year. And many of the phenotypes that genetic variation or mutants in plants exhibit are easy to visualize without any equipment like a microscope. And I'll show you some of those phenotypes of various mutants in a moment. But first, I wanted to talk about the particular type of plant that we've been developing for classroom models. And that particular plant is Brassica rapa. Brassica rapa, as a model for classrooms, was first introduced by Paul Williams, who bred very rapid cycling versions of Brassica rapa. These are plants that go from seed to seed in about eight weeks or so. And you can see, by, as, as, as a scale here, the fingers of someone pollinating these plants with a toothpick, how small they are. They're flowering within a week or so of planting. And so the lines that Paul Williams developed have self-incompatibility. That means they need to find a different plant in order to have a pollination event and produce seeds. But for a genetic model for the classroom, and these are a wonderful model for many things, but we wanted to extend it as a genetic model by making self-compatible class plants. And by me, I'm referring to me and my colleague, Scott Woody, who's been my partner in this effort at the University of Wisconsin. And we've worked along with teams of undergraduates and high school students to develop a self-compatible uh, version of Brassica rapa that has this rapid life cycle as a genetic model. Some of the advantages of Brassica rapa compared to another well-known plant genetic model, Arabidopsis thaliana, are that the Brassica rapa flowers are larger. What that means is they're much easier to do pollinations, to cross one plant with another. Uh, also, their seeds are much larger, so they're easier to handle and plant in an orderly manner. And finally, shown here is Scott Woody holding our Brassica rapa plants versus Arabidopsis. Brassica rapa tends to grow in an upright manner. It doesn't flop over and get entangled as Arabidopsis does. So it's much more uh, of a friendlier model for classroom use. What I want to show you now are some of the mutants that uh, we've found with our teams of undergraduates and high school students working along with Scott. Here's an example of a mutant, an albino mutant, that, sh that is illustrated here as these light yellow plants. This is a mutant that doesn't produce as much chlorophyll as the normal plant, and the normal plant we call the wild type. This is caused by a single gene mutation that's recessive. So thus, you see this nice pattern of Mendelian segregation in this population of plants in which the albino mutant is segregating. In other words, it forms a nice Mendelian segregation pattern where one-fourth of the plants are um, homozygous mutant, or shown here in this illustration as little a, little a. And one of the things that you can do with this in the classroom, for example, is save seed from the plants that are green, the so-called plants that have a wild-type phenotype. And the students could find, for example, that some of these will breed true, those that are homozygous big A and don't carry the defective gene for the albino trait. But others that are heterozygous, in other words, they have one copy of the mutant and one copy of the wild or normal, wild-type or normal gene, will, in the next generation, when self-pollinated, uh, produce mutants again from a plant that had been green. Another example of a mutant are mutants that cannot see light. These are in a particular light sensor called phytochrome. Normally, when plants germinate, if they find themselves in dark conditions, for example, they're buried under some soil or some leaf litter, they will put all their energy into elongation growth in order to push up through that dark environment they're in to find the light. And once they find the light, they stop elongating and spread out. And in this population, which segregates for the mutant that can't see light, 
you see many wild type plants that have spread out nicely, but the mutants continue to grow tall because they can't sense as well that they're in the light. This also is a recessive mutation that's very easy to phenotype, in other words, to study its uh, growth pattern in the, in the classroom. Another example are mutants that don't have petals. This is the apetalid mutant. Petals out in nature typically are used by plants to attract pollinators. Of course, we're the pollinators of this plant, or your students will be in the classroom, so this mutant does just fine without petals as long as we pollinate it. And shown here is the wild type plant where you can see all the uh, color at the top of the plant representing the petals. One last mutant that I want to mention to you is one called abnormal leaf. And I mention this mutant because it's dominant. And this illustrates an important principle in genetics. That is, that mutants aren't necessarily always recessive. That's a common misconception. Here's a particular mutant that's dominant, and it causes these leaves uh, to form this very shriveled uh, pattern of very abnormal leaves. Shown here is a plant that has one copy of the mutant gene and one copy of the wild type version of the gene that causes this abnormal leaf phenotype. Obviously, there are many important conditions in humans, for example, where dominant genes uh, can play a, a very negative role. An example is Huntington's disease, where a dominant version of the a dominant mutant version of the gene can lead to disease in humans. So this plant model is a nice illustration of the types of dominant diseases that can occur. But now I want to tell you how we can find the genes that are represented by these mutants and a way that you might be able to bring modern molecular genetics into your classroom. So I want to go back to that ex example of segregating mutants and illustrate how we get to a segregating population of mutants. For example, we can have a mutant parent, like one of those albinos, or a uh, plant that can't sense light. It can be crossed to a normal parent, which we'll call the wild type. And at a particular gene, which is illustrated here on a chromosome of those plants with the letter big A or lowercase a, which I'll call little a, um, the various versions of the gene. And the lowercase is typically how we designate the mutant. So here's a mutant parent that can be crossed by taking pollen from it and transferring it to a wild type female plant. And this will produce in the next generation an F1 hybrid. A combination of, of these two parents, a chromosome from each. And I'm just showing one of many of the chromosomes for illustration. This F1 hybrid can undergo self-pollination. And in its next generation, as you know, these traits will segregate. As I showed earlier for the albino trait, this will segregate uh, three to one, where we have three wild type for every one mutant. And of course, the mutants are where that mutant gene is homozygous, as illustrated by the individuals in this segregating population uh, with the box and the asterisks. So how can we uh, use a segregating population to find a gene? I want to introduce the concept of DNA polymorphisms. And that is, if you have two parents creating these populations that have differences in their DNA sequence throughout their chromosomes, these can be used as addresses for where genes are on the chromosome. We call them molecular markers. And any difference in DNA sequence is potentially a molecular marker. Shown here are just some of the chromosomes of Brassic arapa showing that we have a rich set of markers that cover uh, the chromosomes very thoroughly. And there are various ways we can look at those polymorphisms. One way that's commonly used nowadays because of lowered cost and increased efficiency is just to sequence the entire genome of organisms to find which have one version of a gene versus another. But a technique that's very amenable to the classroom is a technique called gel electrophoresis, where we can amplify with a technique called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, various pieces of these chromosomes and ask uh, what's, whether the one parent or the other parent's version is present. Because we've chosen regions where there's a slight size variation 
in the version from one or the other parent. And so those PCR products can be run on gels. This is a typical gel electrophoresis setup. And this is from the University of Nebraska. And what's being detected are these DNA polymorphisms. So shown here, for example, on the far end is one parent that has the F genotype. And amplifying a bit of its DNA, an address on one of its chromosomes, gives a band of a certain size on that gel electrophoresis. The other parent, indicated R here, is actually um, a bit larger fragment, so it migrates to a higher position on the gel. A F1 hybrid between both parents is shown in lane H there, where you can see it has one copy of the F gene and one copy of the one marked R. And then in a segregating population from that F1 hybrid or heterozygote self-pollinating, you can see at that particular locus in the offspring, all different types. Some get one of each copy. Some get only the one from the F parent. Others only the one uh, from the H parent. And so how can we use this then to determine uh, the location of a mutant gene? Well, again, if we get, have a situation where we can pick out the mutants, in many cases, in cases of recessive mutants, they're one-fourth of the population, we can make DNA just from those recessive mutants. And so if we're tracking, for example, a gene that causes dwarfism, which we have done, we take all the, the DNA from all of the dwarf plants. And because they're homozygous for the mutant, in other words, they're little a, little a at both chromosomes, they have to have the same genotype there. In other words, it's all the green chromosome, if you will, that's present in the plants that are homozygous mutants. And then we can query all of the chromosomes in these mutants that have segregated in the population and ask, do we find a something called linkage uh, to that mutant? Linkage is a genetic concept that indicates something is tightly associated with something else. So we're looking for a type of DNA, a type of address of a particular region of a chromosome that's always associated with the mutant gene. And of course, due to recombination events, the chromosomes are a mixed up pattern of green and blue segments. And imagine we took one of those polymorphic DNA markers from the M1 part of the chromosome. If we ran that type of gel that I showed, we wouldn't see any particular pattern. We'd see a mixture of sometimes homozygous for the big A, shown here in blue, or homozygous uh, for the little a, shown in green, and often a mixture. Or if we took uh, a, an address of a chromosome uh, down in the lower region of this chromosome, we'd see a similar mixture. But imagine we had a marker that was very close, or perhaps part of the gene itself. Now what we'll see is only a particular uh, band, only one band, the band that's the size of that uh, region from the one parent that contained the mutation. And that tells us we're getting very close to the gene. And by doing this process repeatedly, we can narrow into an interval that often contains just one or a few genes and discover the gene. And in fact, if you don't have the capability in your classroom uh, to do this type of gel analysis, we're creating a system that lets students choose random locations of, chromatin, of chromosomes and determine if they can find linkage, because we have software that will simulate these gels to create sort of virtual gels where students can do these types of experiments on the computer in the classroom. So these types of polymorphisms, I wanted to end by saying, enable certain things. As I mentioned, they enable us to find the genes responsible for various traits, like an albino or dwarfism or an abnormal leaf. And, but once we know the difference in a particular gene, a copy that's a mutant versus wild type, we can use that difference also to track versions of genes. And versions of genes are known as alleles. So we can track either the, the mutant version that leads to an albino or a dwarf, or the wild type. And examples of this in use in uh, various realms are, for example, marker-assisted breeding in plants and animals, where those breeding new varieties of, for example, cows or corn plants will look at the offspring of a cross, and they'll know that certain offspring will have certain traits even before those 
animals or plants reach adulthood. So if you're a plant breeder, you can take only those plants you want and advance it in your breeding program. And of course, DNA polymorphisms are critical in many tests uh, of whether humans are carriers of certain versions of genes that might contribute uh, to disease. One example that's not a DNA test with which you might be familiar is that all newborns are tested for a particular disorder called phenylketonuria. And that's a disorder that can be controlled by diet. So it's important to find that genetic uh, alteration early after a child is born, because then diet can be modified so the disease is not manifest. In the same way, we could look through our plants and find those that, for example, have the gene for dwarfism. And I wanted to end by showing you how we could correct that dwarfism if we wish to, because the plants that we have that are dwarf are deficient in a particular plant hormone called gibberellin. So in this video I'm about to show, we simply add gibberellin to the plants on the left, but not to those um, on the right. And so I'll run this video, and you can see how rapidly adding back this critical growth hormone can allow the plant to grow normally. And the hormone was just added. Now you can see the time lapse going. And within a day or so, you can start to see a striking difference in those treated plants. They're now recovering from that dwarfism. So over just five or six days, you can see the remarkable difference between the untreated plant and the treated plant. And this illustrates that we've developed these resources that can be used to look at simple things like Mendelian segregation. If you have the capabilities to do modern molecular biology in the lab and molecular genetics, or even if you don't, we have ways you can do it on a computer simulation as well as do physiological experiments with various mutants. There's an illustration of how to rescue a mutant, how to restore a normal growth pattern to a deficient plant. So I'd like to end uh, by thanking the Plant Genome Program at the National Science Foundation, as well as the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for funding our development of these classroom tools. And I want to invite you to visit our website, which is FPSC for fastplant self-compatible dot wisc for wisconsin dot edu and there's much more material at the website than i've had time to tell you about today thank you